Well, good evening, my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ and my dear young people, and a warm welcome. As announced, the topic under consideration is the order of Melchizedek. It's an interesting study, such as, uh, because as we hope to see, Melchizedek is an amazing type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this type, anti-type, is critical because it marks the, the separation of Christianity from Judaism. Yet there are only two places in the Old Testament where the name Melchizedek and some information about him appear. More details about Melchizedek are given in the New Testament, uh, namely in Hebrews. Tonight, I'm going to take a very simple approach. I'm going to track Melchizedek in the Old Testament and the New Testament using the Bible almost exclusively as my reference and following a more or less verse by verse approach. We're going to read a lot of verses tonight. But first, let's consider the name Melchizedek. Melchizedek comes uh, from two Hebrew words, Melchi and Zedek. And it's inevitably translated only twice, Melchizedek. The two source words are Melech, meaning king, and Zedek. Zedek has a lot of uh, different translations in the Bible. And here they are right here. Gesenius in his lexicon notes that Zedek is used in two ways in the scripture. In a physical way, it means straightness or rightness. In an ethical way, it means rectitude, right, or what is right. So there's a very strong connection as we scan through these definitions uh, between what is right and righteousness. Righteousness appears to be a good translation, and that's the one that is, uh, appears in the King James Version in the Melchizedek context. So Melchizedek is king of righteousness. We were introduced to Melchizedek earlier in our introductory reading from Genesis chapter 14. We saw the story of how Abram defeated Chedorlaomer and his confederacy and returned to Jerusalem, meeting with Bera, the king of uh, Sodom, just outside Jerusalem. And at this point, we'll pick up the story in verse 17 of Genesis chapter 14. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale, dale. I found three references uh, to the vale, um, uh, sorry, the valley of, of Sheva, and all three uh, references disagree. They weren't consistent. But we can say with certainty that the valley of Sheva is in the immediate vicinity of Jerusalem. In verses 18 to 20, we, re, we meet Melchizedek, king of Salem. He's the subject of our remarks, and we learn something about him, about his position, his actions, and his relationship with Abraham. It says there that he brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. We're also told here that he was king of Salem. Salem is Jerusalem, and we can check that out by referring to Psalm 76, verses 1 and 2. Salem is first mentioned here, but its history goes back much further than this. He brought forth bread and wine, and he was a priest of the Most High God. In verses 19 and 20, we learn more about Melchizedek. It says, and he blessed him. Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And then in verse 20, he says, Blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. 
So here's the action of a priest, blessing the people and, and also blessing God. And he gave him tithes of all. Well, it, it's, at, at first glance, it's not really clear who's giving who the, the tithes, but it's Abram giving Melchizedek tithes of all the spoils that he'd taken in the battle. Now, notice all the underlined um, items here that deal directly with Melchizedek, who and what he was and what he did. And these are all summarized on the following table. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. He's a priest. Not only that, but he's priest of the most high God. He brought forth bread and wine. He blessed Abram. He blessed God. And he received tithes from Abraham. There's a fair amount of, of information here. And as we proceed, we will be able to build on this base. I want to uh, pause here for a few minutes and, and go out on a bit of a tangent. Periodically, we hear speakers and or we read articles that assert that we don't need to know who Melchizedek was, and we shouldn't spend the time trying to find out. I agree that we don't need to know who he was. However, there are some factors which together may enable us to answer the question to our own satisfaction. My own answer is that Melchizedek was Shem, and I will tell you why. Here are a few factors to consider. One, the importance of Shem as a priest after the flood. There's a comment of, of, of Noah that we'll look at in just a minute. But recall that Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. Well, well Shem was as well. In Genesis 9, verse 26, Noah said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Now, it doesn't say that he was a priest here, but there's a hint here, I think, that's, that's quite strong that indicates that he was. Secondly, there's the importance of the concept of a remnant. Here's the idea that there is always a group somewhere which has maintained the truth. And building on that idea, we know that, that Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. He was also the king of Salem, which suggests that there was a group of believers in Salem at that particular time. The fourth piece of evidence that we'll, we'll look at is a genealogy chart that indicates that Shem and Abraham were contemporary for many, many years. And we'll look at this uh, abbreviated chart in the next slide. Here's a chart from Shem down to Terah. This is based on the genealogies of Genesis chapter 11. Shem was born in the year of the, of the world, 1556, and he died in 2156. From Genesis 11 and verse 26, which we'll see at the bottom of the page, we see that Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Herod. And here we're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume that Abraham was the first and he was begotten 70 years uh, after um, Terah was born. So that brings us up to 1946, 1876, the number above it, plus 70 is 1946, the year of the world, 1946. He lived uh, 175 years and he died in 2121. And if we compare the 2121 with the number at the top of that column, 2156, these numbers would show that actually Shem died later than Abraham. So on this method of thinking, uh, Abraham and Shem were contemporary all of Abraham's life. However, there's another viewpoint on Abraham's birth and death dates. 
Genesis 11.32 tells us that Terah died in Haran at the age of 205. In Genesis 12 and 4, we read that Abraham was 75 years of age when he left Haran. Here's another assumption. If we assume that Abraham left Haran in the same year that Terah died, then we can back calculate Abraham's year of birth to be 2006 of the year of the world. 2081 plus 75 is 2006. And add on the 175 of his lifespan, we can calculate that he died in 2181. In this case, Abraham and Shem were contemporaries for 150 years. Whatever method we choose to use, I think we conclude very accurately that Abraham and Shem were contemporary for many, many years. While we're still out on this tangent, it's interesting to note how many words and ideas appear in Genesis 14 in those four verses we looked at. These are listed here. Sheva, the king's dale, Melchizedek, Salem, bread and wine, priest, most high God, delivered, and tithes. These are all... <laughs> Science is great when it works. These are all words or ideas that first appear in the scripture in Genesis 14. There's at least nine times that, that something like this happens in these few verses. And this may sound the alert that this is an important chapter with an important principle. I want to pass on now for about a thousand years to the time, from the time of Abraham to the time of David. And uh, let us read together from Psalm 110, which is the only other place in the Old Testament where the name Melchizedek is used. Verse 1, Psalm of David, David's writing now, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool now david's opening this psalm by addressing his lord whom we know but whom i will identify um, in, in a minute he instructs oops him to sit at his footstool until he deals with uh, the enemies of that particular person. And then he says, the Lord, or Yahweh, will send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. He's going to send David's Lord uh, back to Zion, and David's Lord will rule from there. Thy people the people that belongs to David's Lord will be willing. They'll support him in the beauties of holiness, or as the Hebrew says, in the splendor of holiness. And then there's mentioned, thou hast the dew of thy youth. And if we check that out from Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19, there's a very strong reference there to resurrection from the dead. And then... David records uh, an oath that, that Yahweh has given about David's Lord. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, when we come down to verse 5 and verse 6, David seems to change and direct his thoughts towards Yahweh. He says, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. And this is David's affirmation of the work of his Lord when he comes back to the earth. 
if we check out uh, Zion in verse 2, and the wars that are mentioned in verses 5 and 6, and compared to the text of Psalm 2, we will find that the subject, the Lord at thy right hand, is the Son of God. It's Jesus himself. And as further proof, the one sitting at the right hand is clearly Christ. Mark makes that very clear in Mark chapter 16, verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto him, that's, that's Jesus, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. So let's summarize again on the next slide. There's Jesus sitting on the right hand of God. God instructs Jesus to stay until God deals with his enemies. God will send him to Zion. Jesus will rule. His people will be immortals, supportive of his reign. God affirms the position of Jesus. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And Jesus will conquer. This is some information on the, on the priest after the order of Melchizedek. It's, it's, it's Christ. And there will be some more in, uh, information later on. Before we go to the New Testament and look at that, I want to go out on another tangent. And back in Genesis 14, we saw some of the characteristics of Melchizedek, and they are listed here at the top of this slide. King of righteousness, king of peace, priest of the most high God, brought forth bread and wine, blessed Abram, blessed God. Now, I want to turn to the record of David bringing the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite to the city of David. It's, it's, uh, this account is, is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And as we read that record, note some of the characteristics of Melchizedek that appear there. Okay, here we are in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 12. And it was told King David, saying, the Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God uh, from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Verse 13, and it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. Verse 14, and David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod, which we know is a clothing item that belongs to the priest. We'll skip down to verse 17. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it, and David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well to the women as men, to everyone a piece of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed, everyone, to his house. In this slide and in the previous slide, when we consider the underlying passages, can we not see that, that David, the king in Jerusalem, also carried out the part of a priest and reenacted the actions of Melchizedek? For now, though, I want to move on uh, another thousand years to the New Testament times to learn more about the order of Melchizedek. And we'll go to the letter of the Hebrews. It's not too surprising that, that Melchizedek is covered in Hebrews because the, the writer is trying to persuade the Jewish Christians not to go back to the law of Moses. The writer lays out his argument to show the superiority of Christ to the angels, to Moses, to the law, to the Levitical priesthood. We would not be able to understand thoroughly Melchizedek in the Old Testament 
without the information that we receive in Hebrews. And here we have a vivid application of the principle that we often use during learning the Bible, uh, learning to read the Bible effectively seminars. And that principle is the old, the new is in the old concealed, the, the old is in the new revealed. And that's what happens here with Melchizedek. We'll put in at Hebrews chapter 4 and read verses 14 to 16. These verses, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, seem to be, have, have been inserted into the story of Melchizedek for the purpose of exhortation, and we'll see that in just a minute. We'll learn more of Melchizedek, but let us also be exhorted. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus is called a high priest only in the letter to the Hebrews. We have this high priest. He's passed into the heavens, and we have the connection there with Psalm 110 and Mark chapter 16. He's sitting at the right hand of God. Our high priest understands our weaknesses because he himself has been tempted, but he never sinned. And the first ex exhortation is the one that's underlined here in verse 14. Let us hold fast our profession. That is our faith that we professed when we were baptized. The second exhortation is given in verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly onto the throne of grace. Let us come confidently onto the throne of grace that we may have, uh, find, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So now we'll pass on to Hebrews 5, where we'll pick up more characteristics of the high priest, which we haven't seen to date. Hebrews 5, verse 1. For every high priest is to taken from among men, is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. The high priest is Jesus. And notice what it says in verse 2. Who, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Notice the, the, the emphasis there. He himself also is compassed with the infirmity. Verse 3, and by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. I hesitate to say this, but I'll make an aside here. I'll note that there's some debate in our community about verse 3. But I believe that the Bible is very clear, verse 2 and 3, and on the next slide, uh, number 7, verse 7, provide good evidence that verse 3 is absolutely correct. The writer uh, continues his argument in verse 4, and no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron, so also Christ, glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. This was the first step in God defining his son to be the order of priest after the order of Melchizedek. Thou art my son. The very next verse, though, carries on where he says, and, and he saith in another place, Thou art a priest for af forever after the order of Melchizedek. God defines his own son as being that priest. Verse 7 relates again to the weakness of the flesh, which we saw a minute ago in verse 2. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death or out of death, and was heard in that he feared. Verses 8 and 9 deal with the, the preparation which led to his being made perfect. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, 
and being made perfect, being made immortal, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. In verse 10, again, we see a, a reiteration of the same statement of God we've seen before on several occasions. Call of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Verses 6 and 10 on this slide are the two places in Hebrews 5 where Melchizedek is mentioned. Let's jump over to Hebrews 6 and verse um, 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. I'm reading here from the ESV. God cannot lie. His word alone is true. He didn't need to make an oath, but he did it for us on account of our weakness. The oath provides absolute confirmation of the unspeakable hope that we have, the hope of immortality and all that is wrapped up in that term. <clears throat> Passing on to verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us um, fled for refuge there may um, cause an idea to, to spring in their mind about the city of refuge and i think there, there's some some meat in that bone so to speak the writer exhorts us to hold fast to the hope set before us knowing that our high priest has gone before us into the very presence of God on our behalf, then this hope can be a stabilizer and a motivator in our lives. The hope of becoming in nature what he is now, sinless, immortal. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf having become an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 20 is the one reference in Hebrews 6 to Melchizedek. Now we'll come to Hebrews 7, which contains six references to Melchizedek. Verses 1 and 2 contain information we've already seen in Genesis 14. For this Melchizedek, King of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham also gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpre interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. The two words after that are important. Righteousness must come before peace. This is a characteristic of the kingdom. If we look at uh, Psalm uh, 72, for example, it speaks there of the reign of Christ. And it says, in his day shall the righteous flourish in abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. There won't be peace without prior righteousness. Verse 3 now presents information that helps paint a literary picture, not the actual description of Melchizedek. It says there, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Notice there's, there's no descendants. No predecessors mentioned. There's no reference to death. There's no reference to relinquishing the office of a priest. The picture of, of is one of unending priesthood. And this points to the antitype, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Verse 4 also, again, refers to the type of Melchizedek, specifically his greatness compared to that of Abraham. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. The greatest of all the patriarchs of the nation of Israel was Abraham. And even he gave tithes to Melchizedek. Consider how great Melchizedek must have been. The writer goes on to speak of the Levitical priests of, of the day. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So they're, under the law, the Levites received tithes. They were descendants of Abraham through the line of Aaron, of course and they received tithes from the people. But he whose descent is not counted from them, that's Melchizedek, received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Abraham, their forefather, paid tithes to Melchizedek and receive blessings from him. The story goes on in, in verse 8. And here, men that die receive tithes. That's the Levitical priesthood. But there, in Genesis 14, he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. The picture we have of Melchizedek was that his priesthood was unending. He lived. And of course, the reference is, is pointing to Christ. Verse 9 is a key verse. But as I may so say, the writer is recognizing that he's using a figure of speech here figuratively, metaphorically, typically, Levi paid tithes in Abraham since he was Abraham's descendant. The fact that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, in effect, defined Abraham's position and the position of his descendants as being lower than the position of Melchizedek. It also defined the Levitical priesthood as being inferior to the priesthood of Melchizedek. And now we come to a, a very interesting and important subject, the effect of the Melchizedek priesthood on the Mosaic priesthood and system. Hebrews 7 verse 11 says, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, Well, the fact is there wasn't perfection by the Levitical priesthood. And we'll, this is stated on the next slide, clearly, as we'll see shortly, there was a need for another priesthood, another order of priesthood, another system outside that of Aaron. And this was the order of Melchizedek, which pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. For under it, that is under the Levitical priesthood, the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of, of Aaron? And that is because of the weakness of the Levitical priesthood. Verses 12 to 14 speak of the changes. For the priesthood being changed, there is of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, not Levi, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Passing on to verse 15, and here the, the writer starts to bring the whole discussion together. For it is yet far more evident that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest 
who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. And this is the antitype of the, the priesthood of Melchizedek brought to fruition in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ from the line of Judah has been named a priest after the order of Melchizedek because he's immortal and his priesthood will never ever end. Again in verse 17 is God's affirmation. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verses 18 and 19 bring us back to the point made in the last slide in verse 11, the weakness of the Levitical priesthood and the lack of perfection which it provided. All stated here in very clear language. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and profitableness, unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. Verses 20 and 21. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. And, and we're going to reiterate again to ideas previously expressed in Hebrews chapter 6. For those priests were made without an oath, but this, Christ, Christ priesthood, with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Our priest was made so by an, of an oath. This also made him a guarantee of a better covenant. By so much was Jesus made a surety or a guarantee of a better covenant. And that covenant is the Abrahamic covenant by which forgiveness of sins and immortality on the basis of faith had been made available to those that believe. Hebrews uh, 7, verse 23. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. The Levitical priesthood uh, went on and a priest would die and another would take his place. In Christ's priesthood, he never dies. He continues forever. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Our priest is immortal, continues forever, is able to save those that come unto him in faith. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost, them uh, that come unto him, sorry, Save to the uttermost that come unto him, uh, to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Verse 26. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. The Levitical priests were constantly making offerings, day after day, year after year. Jesus made one offering and one offering only. He offered himself for himself and for his people. In verse 28, the writer makes the difference between the Levitical priest and, and Christ very clear. For the law maketh men priest, high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Now will add here verse 28 from the ESV. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. We would do well if we periodically reviewed the role of Christ, our priest, after the order of Melchizedek. There is one final item with which I will bring my remarks to a close. In Revelation 7, we see a picture of the immortalized saints from every country gathered together and praising God 
and his son, Jesus. Revelation 7, verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth on the throne, and on to the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God for ever and ever. Notice in verse 9, it says that they're clothed with white robes. And note in the following verses, um, 10 to 12, that they're praising God. Passing on now to verse 13, it says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? I'm going to make an assertion here that these white robes signify two things. First of all, that the wearer of the white robe is immortal. They've been given immortality. And secondly, I'm going to assert that these are the garments of a priest, or they signify the garments of a priest, perhaps reminiscent of the ephod. This agrees with their work, which is given in verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of, of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he sitteth on the throne, uh, shall dwell among them. This same group of immortalized saints is spoken of a few chapters earlier in Revelation chapter 5. Here we'll see a song of the redeemed, the group that's been found acceptable at the judgment seat of Christ, the group that has been made immortal, the group that has now an endless life, apart from the law, wearing, I suggest, priestly garments, serving God, and administering, administering the blessings of the new covenant that we saw in Hebrews chapter 7. In Hebrews 5, verse 9, we read, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and nation, a people and nation. They have been made kings and priests, kings and priests, after the order of Melchizedek, the same order as that of their master. Brothers and sisters, we've been given the unspeakable hope of being part of that group on the basis of faith and faithful walk. May we keep our focus clear in these last very troubled days. Our prayer is, brothers and sisters, that by grace, we might be granted a place in that number in the very near future.